and I would like to, to invite John Woods, who is the Chief Technology Officer of um, Algorand Foundation. And uh, John is going to, we, we have asked John to really share with us um, just a quick kind of overview of what, what is post-quantum blockchain and especially for the industry, businesses that are, that are using blockchain, what do they need to do, uh, how they can prepare for post-quantum era and all that. So thank you very much, John. Uh, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, hello, everyone. This is my uh, first time giving a, a metaverse talk. So um, yeah, bear with me. Usually I have a little bit of a different structure. But over the next uh, 10 minutes, I'm going to give you, hopefully, uh, a, a nuanced overview of post-quantum, how it applies to blockchain, and how we achieve quantum-resistant blockchains. For reference, my name is John Woods. I'm the CTO or Chief Technology Officer at Algorand Foundation. Algorand is a layer one blockchain. Okay, so it's like an Ethereum, if you like. It's a programmable blockchain. It's its own self-sovereign layer one. Um, and prior to this, I've worked uh, both at the European Central Bank, Bank um, at the Irish Central Bank as a senior architect and applied cryptographer. I've also worked um, on Ethereum professionally, and I've worked on Cardano as the chief architect, which is another layer one blockchain. So my life has been spent uh, working either in uh, banks like City uh, Central Bank or indeed um, software houses like Ericsson, or uh, in the latter half of my career, I've started working directly on these various blockchains. So I kind of span both worlds and I understand, um, well, I certainly have a flavor for the types of things that, that people uh, ask questions about um, who come from a more traditional software background or even a, a regulatory and compliance background. Okay, cool. So let me just run through. I've got a couple of topics I'd like to discuss. First thing is, what is a quantum computer? Answer, a quantum computer is a new type of computer, which is not pervasive yet, okay? We only have these prototype ones that are not, that don't have any teeth because they're not powerful enough yet, but we've proved the physics behind quantum computing. We have proved that it's possible to harness the power of quantum mechanics um, in order to speed up certain types of operation. So just to be clear, normal computers, we call them classical computers, and they operate on ones and zeros. Um, and these are the types of computers you use every day, your MacBook, your iPhone, your Dell. Okay, they're very good, obviously, at mathematical computation, and we've seen that, of course. Um, the very fact that we're in this room and you're hearing me live and you can see all these 3D graphics proves that. Um, modern cryptography, which is, of course, encryption and digital signatures, etc. That modern cryptography, the reason it can't be forged or messed with is because of certain mathematical problems that are hard for these normal computers we have today. And the key insight to quantum computers is that for certain mathematical problems, not all of them, but for certain ones, quantum computers give a parallel speed up. And unfortunately for modern cryptography, the types of mathematical problems that we use to make cryptography hard for computers to solve without the key is trivially solvable for a quantum computer. So the key takeaway here is we use cryptography to hide information and to attest to things. To do that and to make it so that no one else can forge our signatures and no one can decrypt our information without the key, we rely on classes of mathematical problem. Those mathematical problems are hard even for the most powerful normal computers we use today. But soon, or well, some people say never, but uh, I believe soon we will have the advent of quantum computers that will be able to solve these problems. And then people will be able to break certain types of encryption and break digital signatures. And of course, blockchains use lots of this cryptography and that's why we about it. Okay, so that's what is a quantum computer, and I talked a little bit about uh, the types of mathematical problems that quantum computers uh, can break. And to be quite specific, there are two algorithms that quantum computers employ um, that tend to, to to affect modern cryptography. The first is Shor's algorithm, which is essentially a, a quantum algorithm that allows you to factor numbers quite quickly. And uh, you will see that a lot of modern cryptography is either based on the toughness of factoring large numbers or in solving things like a discrete logarithm problem. The second algorithm is called Gordon cryptographic standards. Okay, so Algorand uses, so Algorand, the, the layer one blockchain where I work and, and the one that I'm developing, it uses modern cryptography um, in a number of different places. It uses hash functions to link the blocks and it uses digital signatures to sign transactions. So when you spend your Algorand or you're interacting with a smart contract on Algorand, you have to issue a transaction and that transaction is digitally signed, just like a check, except for in this case, we sign it cryptographically using the mathematical problems I mentioned briefly earlier on. So in any blockchain, and again, maybe I'll just quickly um, talk about what a blockchain is. A blockchain is a distributed ledger. You probably heard that term before. It's um, essentially uh, an interconnected network of computers that are all running the same software we call a node, and they form a distributed, um, a distributed network. 
and that network, all, all, all the computers in that network have a copy of the blockchain and they all, and the secret sauce here is that when funds are moved on the blockchain, everyone ensures, everyone in the, distribu in the distributed network ensures, and so no one can defraud the system because everyone checks it. That's the idea of these decentralized systems. So in any of these blockchains, it doesn't matter whether it's Bitcoin, Ethereum, Cardano, Algorand, Avalanche, uh, or whatever else uh, you want to name. There's about three different places in these blockchains that we have to apply post-quantum technologies in order to secure these networks against a quantum attack. The three places are the consensus mechanism. So that is um, the mechanism we use to make sure that all of the transactions are processed on the network and that, that, that the network stays in, in, a, in a state of parity. Second, um, the accounts. So everyone will be familiar with this idea on a blockchain that you have a receive address or a public key and you spend with your private key. Well, the account system needs to take uh, advantage of post-quantum cryptography because if it doesn't, it'll be trivially easy for someone to reverse a public key into a private key, something which we currently think of as unthinkable. And then finally, add the history of the chain because the network will have over many, many years processed thousands or millions of blocks. And these blocks, um, they were uh, created at a time when we were using classical cryptography. So of course, we will need a quantum algorithm to secure the history of the chain. Now, Algorand has only taken one step in this, in this regard. We have a quantum algorithm approved by NIST, the uh, institute in the US that, that sanctions um, the appropriate cryptographic algorithms to use. And we use a lattice-based post-quantum cryptographic algorithm. That is one that uses the hardnesses of lattice and n-dimensional space in order to achieve an algorithm that is tough even for these quantum computers to solve. Again, re-establishing the hardness of modern cryptography. So this algorithm, is called, this algorithm is called Falcon, and we have used Falcon digital signatures to sign the entire history of the Algorand blockchain. But we can't stop there. As I mentioned, we also need to move to a place where we're using a post-quantum consensus mechanism. Right now, Bitcoin uses essentially the security of SHA-2 as its, as its um, uh, consensus mechanism using proof of work. And actually that's quite safe in a quantum context. It's still reasonably strong. On Algorand and other proof of stake networks like Ethereum and Cardano, um, one needs to move away from the current mechanism that's used for uh, consensus because um, the consensus mechanism on Algorand and other networks uses things like verifiable random functions, which are not intrinsically quantum safe. So we need to move to a quantum proof verifiable random function. And then finally, accounts themselves. You may be familiar with this idea that on blockchain, you write down the 24 words when you, when you open a new account, and that's your private key. Well, in a post-quantum context, those 24 words are more like 700 words. And so we have to find, um, because of course the keys are bigger uh, for, quant for most quantum algorithms. So we have to find a way to move from a digital signature scheme for making transactions and signing transactions uh, that is not quantum safe to one which is quantum safe, but also preserves uh, the user experience. So, I mean, that's essentially it. That's uh, essentially what quantum computers are, how, the, how uh, modern cryptography essentially works. Um, and the places that we need to apply quantum, uh, quantum proof or quantum secure cryptography in a blockchain is consensus, the accounts, and the history of the chain. And like I mentioned, Algorand has only done one of these. But it's really ahead of the game in the sense that most of the other blockchains have haven't started this journey. Um, and one last thing to say. Modern cryptographic standards in, in the post-quantum uh, sphere are still emerging. And there's different classes of mathematical security that we're looking at, things like multivariate, uh, cryptography, code-based cryptography, hash-based, and indeed lattice, as I mentioned, that we use on Algorand. Um, but we may see some of these schemes broken over time. And so this is still very much an emerging threat of quantum. And indeed, the mechanisms that we use to mitigate the quantum threat are also uh, leading edge mathematics and uh, computer engineering. Finally, I should just say that no one can predict exactly when a quantum computer is going to appear. We have some idea of where we are in terms of the, you know, the power of a quantum computer is measured in, the, in qubits rather than bits. And at the moment, they're pretty powerful, but they're not powerful enough to attack um, production grade encryption or production grade digital signatures. But when we do get to the point where we can stabilize a quantum computer with enough error correcting qubits in superposition, we will then be in a place where these quantum algorithms will be the only choice if you want to enjoy privacy on the internet or indeed a blockchain that is still um, safe to use. Um, if you have any questions, happy to take them. A lot to cover there. Um, unfortunately, he didn't have a lot of time, but um, yeah, hope that was helpful. Hi, John. Yes, that was, that was very helpful. Um, I guess the question was um, for, for businesses and enterprises that are using um, the traditional blockchain chains, Ethereum and others, um, yes. to, to prepare for 
post quantum era do they need to uh, in terms of how they transition um is is, is one option to start using uh, a new blockchain or make changes to the existing blockchain infrastructures or how how should they go about that Right. So, you know, let's take Ethereum as the market leader, right? The, one of the biggest blockchains out there that's programmable. Um, Vitalik Buterin, uh, one of the founders and, and a very brilliant mind, um, recently published his thoughts on how to move Ethereum into a post-quantum era. And it's a long post and it has some mathematics in it, but it, it can essentially be summarized as um, we're somewhat safe with hash functions, but we'll deal with it when it, when it, when it happens. And I don't think that that's a great approach. And I wrote an article for CoinDesk on this that you can you, you uh, Google my name and you Google quantum security Ethereum it'll it'll pop up. Um, I think we need to be more proactive on this. I mean, I suppose it's a little bit like uh, the boogeyman, right? It's like, well, no one's ever seen a quantum computer that can attack these algorithms yet, and so will it will it ever come? Um, mm. I take um, a pessimistic approach generally on things. I assume bad things will happen, and so um, I try to I like to be proactive about uh, our approach to these things. And for me an elegant transition from classical cryptography to a post-quantum uh, cryptographic standard is essential. Now, you don't have to take my word for it because if you think of it this way, look at what the big tech companies are doing. A few mm. months ago, Google added Kyber, um, post-quantum key encapsulation to Chrome. So your Chrome browser now knows how to do these things. Apple added post-quantum primitives to iMessage, you know, the blue bubbles that we text on our iPhone. They now incorporate post-quantum cryptography um, in iMessage as part of their PQ3 standard. And we're seeing this in other places as well. SSH has added it. OpenSSL has added it. So, you know, the companies, they're not adding these technologies, this heavy math, all this code to complicate their code bases. They're adding it because they, um, like me, I, I presume, assume that this will happen. And so to answer your question more directly, if you're using Ethereum, um, you're waiting on the Ethereum developers and indeed the Ethereum steering committee to make the decision that this is something that they have to, they have to address. At the moment, that's, their position is that they're not going to actively address it. And so, yes, your choice would really boil down to um, have your own quantum abstraction or, which is essentially uh, very, very technically diff difficult to do, or uh, move to a chain that does take quantum um, security seriously. Mm. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Has anyone got any other questions? Uh, please, please do write in the chat box. I understand that's quite a heavy topic, so yeah. <laughs> it's probably not not one. Sarah Jane, I, I see. I a, see. The question yeah. we have from Sarah Jane: If a blockchain yeah. gets hacked by quantum computer, is it possible to recover, or would a fork have to happen, etc.? Yes, very good question, Sarah. Uh, so, the answer is. If a, if a blockchain was hacked by a quantum computer, one of three things would happen. Either, mm. and, and these are the three things I mentioned earlier, the consensus, the accounts, or the history. Someone could either go back and rewrite the history of blockchain, which we all understand is not- The whole, the whole, reason, the whole raison d'etre of blockchain mm. is that the history is immutable. So if someone did that, that um, you would have to repair that history by forking. Um, if someone was to attack um, the accounts on a, on, a, on a blockchain, for example, um, maybe there's a large account on Bitcoin and I want to reverse the public key of that account into the private key so I can spend those funds. Maybe I'll take mm. Michael Saylor's wallet, right? Because he's got lots of Bitcoin and I have a quantum computer, so I'm going to reverse I'm going to reverse his public key. Well, if I do that and I just attack him and I leave all the other users alone, well, maybe he just never gets his money back and no one bothers forking Bitcoin because no one wants to do it. And then finally, just as another contrived example, but one that's very real, if, one attack, if the consensus mechanism of a blockchain is attacked by a quantum computer, that is the actual block validation and transaction validation process, we could see transactions validated on the chain that are either invalid or double spends or indeed fraud. So in, in all of these situations, as Sarah, uh, as Sarah Jane says, the only option really is to fork the chain. Um, in some of these situations, you might find that uh, some users just get affected and the chain at large decides not to fork. Um, and instead implement some kind of quantum uh, quantum resistance um, at the point of attack. So, uh, yeah, that's the answer there. It's it's not 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 a good story. And do you I think, don't, John, that the um, these attacks, as we have seen over the last 12, 14 years, that these the, it makes them stronger. As Nino Nassim Taleb says, "anti fragile." Do you think that these attacks, uh, the the system will learn, the the programmers will learn when when we take, for example, Bitcoin Ethereum's example world practical attacks going on and 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 the and, and and the system is becoming more and more robust and resistant and and we are learning 
uh, as we go along? Very much so. And I think this mm. is natural. You know, there's no point in, you know, we can't fear research. As an example, only a few weeks ago, the leading post-quantum cryptographic algorithm, Falcon, which is the one we use, uh, co-developed by a bunch of incredibly gifted people, including Chris Pikehart, who's uh, one of the world's foremost leading experts on, on lattice-based cryptography. There was a paper published by a gentleman called Chen, and it purported to have found a polynomial solution to lattice-based n-dimensional problems. And uh, um, essentially what it was saying was, lattice-based crypto is weak and I can solve it, even on, uh, on, on a quantum computer. And um, it turned out that there was a bug in this incredibly uh, detailed paper. And so lattice-based crypto is fine. Uh, we don't have any problems with it. But I guess my point was simply this. At that juncture, when I thought that that paper was real and we were still trying to find out whether there was a problem with it, many people around the world thought, oh my God, you know, 10 or 15 years of mathematical work on lattice-based cryptography could essentially be totally wasted here. Maybe we're at a point where that's just not good. Um, it's not strong enough. And so we yeah. are now in a place where, of course, we know it is still good and, um, and, and things are okay. But my point is simply, we shouldn't fear the research. We shouldn't fear the progression. We need to know that things are really secure, not just that we think they're secure. And I think that um, most cryptographers um, and most uh, engineers working in the blockchain space recognize that and value uh, progression, both in terms of adversary and in terms of defense. Um, I would mm. say as well, I see a question from Rich, Rich Flair. Uh, he says, what are the key challenges that researchers face in qu on quantum resistant blockchain tech? And I think the answer is simply just the complexity of the mathematics. So, you know, we are operating, like I mentioned earlier on, at the, at the real edge of distributed systems engineering, computer engineering, applied mathematics, and cryptography. And so this is a space which there are very few people uh, working. Um, and indeed, it's a space that's really quite, uh, quite complex to work in. So I think it's just quite slow to develop new standards. And it's, it's also quite slow to be sure or to have a high degree of certainty that we are working on, on we are working with technologies that are going to be safe. There needs to be a lot of cryptanalysis that, that occurs where we check and, and try to break these algorithms to gain a high degree of certainty around their security, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. It does make sense. And I think the, um, the last question is, is that we, we talk about the theoretical possibilities and we prepare for them. But people say that practically speaking, uh, it, is, it is unlikely that uh, a grand scale attack would 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 happen on these on the public blockchains uh, do you think that there is a practical possibility that it will happen someday soon in the near, near future i think so and of course these things are incredibly difficult to predict so i wouldn't uh, have such hubris that i would think that i can predict it accurately but um i think that if you look at the actions of of apple google and, and others adding post quantum cryptography to their products if you look at the progression of IBM, you look at the progression of um, Google and the others that are working on post-quantum technologies, or sorry, quantum, quantum computing, um, and you look at the speed at which we are progressing generally in terms of computer engineering and computer science, both in terms of things like AI and others, I suspect, um, given we know that these technologies work, right? We know quantum computers can exist. We know that they, that they fundamentally work. We've proven that. Um, what we don't have at this point is scaled up quantum computer. So when you're building these things, it's not just a case of building a, a you know a toy version. You need to build a serious uh, version. And so as you scale up quantum computers with more and more qubits, they get harder to to keep uh, in in a correct state. They get harder to cool. They get harder to to basically uh, work with. But I think if if history has taught us anything, it's that we will probably overcome these technical challenges. And I believe that it's likely that we will see a quantum machine that is threatening within the next kind of five to seven years. That will be my guess. But uh, it could be 25, it could be 35 years, it could be more. Um, but my guess is the next five to seven years, we're gonna see something serious. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, for uh, an excellent talk. Um, thank you. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not my sure pleasure. if Rob, Rob Campbell is, is here. Rob, are you here? Uh, if you're here, can you please type in the chat, uh, chat box? Um, We'll just wait for another minute or so, and then we conclude our session. Uh, maybe you're using a different ID. Rob, if you are here, if you just chat in the chat box and we'll, we'll let you in. Rob Campbell has published a bunch of papers, as I mentioned earlier, 
um, he's um, uh, post um, quantum secure uh, uh, lead uh, at IBM and also a professor at Capital Technology University. He's been a fellow for, for many years, BBA, and he's, he's published many papers and some really interesting ones uh, on, uh, on, on post-quantum cryptography, uh, how industry can prepare. Uh, and going back all the way to 2018, 2019, I remember he presented his paper at our first international scientific conference in 2019, March, in London. And since then, he's published many papers. Um, the one that you see just by the uh, speaker banner, uh, it was the one that he published in 2019, in, in, in March 2019. Um, the one you see on the, um, um, the, uh, the other end, where you see Rich, Rich Flair standing, a performance comparison of post-quantum algorithms in blockchain. And um, you can see here Falcon signatures and, and others uh, that, that John mentioned, uh, the various different signature algorithms. This is from Brunel University, which is a university in London. And uh, their researchers uh, published this uh, very interesting paper. So the, I think somebody asked about uh, more research, yeah, definitely. I think there there is going to be more more papers we'll see in, in future on 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 post quantum cryptography, post quantum blockchains. I think it is just getting started, as John said. And next next five years are going to be very very interesting. So I think maybe uh, Rob got stuck somewhere, or uh, maybe he's not here. But anyways, um, so the 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 papers are all open access. By the way, there is there is no fee to read or uh, or download these papers that are published in the journal so um if you go to jbba jbba.scholastica and all these papers are available open access feel free to download read share with others um they are free to read there is no subscription there is no paywall um so i think it, it was a good session very good session i personally learned a lot and some some really interesting questions and i think this is an area which is just uh, uh we just start exploring this really the surface um okay so <clears throat> deborah i think do you want to conclude are you are you around we will um, meet up, yeah, uh, so thank you very much to everybody who's here today yeah. um we we record these sessions and um as dr nasim has said many of the references to the papers can be found um on the jbba scholastica um website so we look forward to seeing you again in, for our july session and as i said a few of you have joined after I spoke initially if anybody has any connections with um, universities or student bodies that will be interested to establish a, G G a kind of a, a BBA student forum where they can assess some of the papers and actually have kind of topic topic related discussions we'd be delighted to invite um, student groups to do that and as I said if you are directly supporting any academic organizations that you feel any of the BBA's work might be able to support be supportive or be of interest please do let us know we'd be absolutely delighted to kind of keep strengthen that connection with academia and thank you very much for all attending. We look forward to seeing you again in July. You'll be hearing from us from in our newsletters and various of July. For all updates, you can, yeah, you, for all updates, you can uh, you can stay in touch with us on our LinkedIn channel. We we post any news and activities from the ecosystem there on a regular basis. And as I said, thank you so much. Um, thank you to our yeah. speaker. Today, and we have got John a certificate Henry. of attendance also, uh, proof of attendance NFT. So if you have, if you want to receive your certificate, associationorg and we'll send you your unique. Uh, continuing professional development certificate issued on the blockchain in the form of NFT. Info at BritishBlockchainAssociation.org. So thank you very much, everyone, and we'll see you all again on the 3rd of July, Wednesday, the 3rd of July. Thank you. Bye-bye.